There's so much cynicism. People are so down in the mouth. The country's depressed. You know, they, I think they're desperate to turn the page. They want to start a new chapter in our national story, but they're not at all sure how or whether it would be possible to do it. Here we are then. Welcome to How to Win an Election. I'm Matt Jolly with your insider's guide to what will happen in the next uh, political year. Welcome, gang. Welcome to Times Radio Towers. Are we all all right? <laughs> yes, thank you. We're Matt, well. did, can I just ask you about that music? Yes, did of course someone, you can, Daddy. Did someone record that specially, or it's, is it a record that I don't know about? It is very specially created. So someone went to work in the morning, said, love, I'm just going off into the studio yeah. to play whatever that was. Yeah, the How to Win an Election music. And yeah. someone had to write it as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, just for us. Just for us. And they added, uh, it started off with the trumpet and then they added a xylophone and a double bass and then here we are. Were they real instruments? They're or? real instruments. No wow. expense spared. Did they come from different parts? The Liberal Democrats played the, the, tri <laughs> the triangle and the xylophone. <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, that's good. It's a good start already. Uh, so I suppose I should introduce you properly now. Uh, that was Daniel Finkelstein, of course, Times columnist, uh, regular... Uh, with me on Times Radio, now part of How to Win an Election, once advised David Owen in the SDP before working for both John Major and William Hague, which wasn't very successful, more successful, helping shape the Tory modernisation of David Cameron and uh, George Osborne, and he spent years prepping Conservative leaders for PMQs. Hello, Danny. Hello. And Polly McKenzie, former Lib Dem policy advisor and speechwriter for Charles Kennedy, Ming Cameron and Nick Clegg, and Ed Davey, who over 15 years helped her party into coalition government and then out again. Polly, nice to see you. Nice to see you. I never wrote a speech for Charles Kennedy. Didn't you? Just, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't want to, like, promote disinformation. No, it's very uh, they, important. They had a very closed shop. Luckily, um, nobody you know. in this room has ever said anything which turned out not to be entirely the case, so it's fine. And Good. finally, Peter Mandelson helped Neil Kinnock drag Labour back from the left and then helped Tony Blair get new Labour into government was slightly less successful at keeping Gordon Brown in power. But joins us now. Hello, Peter. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Matt. You, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, on my... Peter tied the knot on Friday. Got married on Friday. I uh, did. And Pol I... Polly, Danny, were you invited? Yes. <laughs> you were? <laughs> NFI. NFI, not if... <laughs> Unbelievable. It's very nice to be here, Matt. It's not quite where I thought I'd be spending my honeymoon, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes as a surprise for both you and me. <laughs> Well, it's nice It's nice that you're all here. Uh, and if, if you want to get in touch with us at any point, if you've got questions for Danny, Polly, Peter or me, email how to win, how to win all word, how to win at thetimes.co.uk. Uh, and we'll try and answer your questions over the coming weeks. But here we go then. Uh, let's dive in. Let's explain where we are right now. Week one of how to win an election. In our latest YouGov poll, Labour on 48%. Because I think on 24%. So... All to play for. Uh, the Lib Dems <laughs> are on 9%, Reform on 8 the Greens on 5 and the SNP on 4%, although, of course, they're all in Scotland. So before we talk about how to win an election, we should probably establish when we think the election will be. Peter, when do you think Rishi Sinat will go to the country? Well, on the basis that uh, Turkeys don't vote for an early Christmas, I suppose projecting next May is sort of unrealistic. But I'm going to stick with it on the, on the Danny... Finkelstein principle, that the longer you go, the worse it gets. I mean, the idea that, you know, if you just hang out for the entirety of the year and hope that something turns up, you know, you may just result in everything just getting worse and worse and you get a be be worse result than you might otherwise have done if you'd gone early. But I also thought that this Conservative Party conference would be the springboard for that. I thought they would use the conference to sort of frame a great time for change and then build up to a great crescendo next uh, May. But the conference fell flat. The pillars were not put in place. Uh, the springboard is looking you know, decidedly floppy. Um, so it, it may not be it may not be going quite as they hoped, but I'm still not writing off May. So, Danny, explain your, your theory. This is based on your experience yes. working with John Major. Look, there are three dates you can have the election, May, October or January 2025. And my theory when I was working, for, uh, following the experience of working for John Major was that the longer we went on hoping that something would turn up, the stronger the time for a change mood was. And Rishi Sunak clearly realises time for a change is a strong uh, mood because that's why he's trying, I think, unsuccessfully actually to co-opt it. So therefore he knows it's there uh, and the st it'll get stronger. So you would go in May if you saw that was going to happen, you realised it was going to build, and that's when I think coldly 
he should go. But whether he really will, when you arrive in May and you realise you're still a long, long way behind, it does look like that's going to be the case from the figures that we're seeing, whether you'd call an election at that point. So I would say I think they should call it in May, but I suspect they will call it in October. I don't think they'll want to go all the way to January. They'll realise how that looks. They'll also not themselves want to campaign all the way through Christmas. They'll wonder about the Conservative Party. Is anybody got a problem with an ageing base that is difficult? to get them out campaigning. <laughs> so they won't want to do that. Labour could make all the difference. The Labour canvassers are younger yeah. uh, and they'd be readier to go out. They've got thicker, they so, might get a new coat for Christmas and they can get out and campaign. Exactly. So my, my anticipation is they should go in May, they will go in October. That's, that'd be my guess. Polly, what's your theory? I mean, the question is, what, what do you want? Do you want, if you're Rishi Sunak, because in the end it's his decision, do you want to do the best thing for the Conservative Party, which is to minimise your losses, give yourself enough seats to rebuild in five or ten years rather than 15 or 20? Or do you just want to be Prime Minister for as long as possible and go to as many super cool summits and set yourself up for your new life as a multimillionaire in California? And I don't think we know, really. And the, the allure of being Prime Minister is, is pretty strong because it's a pretty awesome job in lots of ways, though he doesn't seem to be enjoying it. Um... I just, I can't imagine in the end that turkey that Peter talked about voting for Christmas. I think they will just let it drift and drift. And I think it's between, for me, October and January. But I, if I, if I was betting, I'd just imagine them dragging it out until the last possible moment. Wow. And then everyone falls over on the ice whilst leafleting. <laughs> That's great and news for the country, yeah. isn't it? We've all got a lot to look forward to. Yeah, you can post your... <laughs> but the good, the good just... thing is, because if you just said, well, we think the election's going to be next month, we'd have to stop the podcast immediately. Yeah, so... Can I just take up the, uh, <laughs> the Polly's point? Obviously, Rishi Sunak does... I think you're right, actually, about that he doesn't particularly enjoy being Prime Minister, but he does think it's his duty and he can do good while being Prime Minister, and that will definitely be a factor. So in what I think will really be the calculation, which is we'll, we'll lose immensely if we go in May, there will also be an element of look at all the good I can do if I just had a few more months and, yes, I can go to that summit rather than someone else and I'd be uh, good at and it. Because something might... The, the, the hope that something might turn up, yes. or that Keir Starmer might make a mistake or, you know, events come along. We've seen that a little bit recently with the and situation in the Middle East. Things happen... Yes, and, and Conservatives might... believe it's better to have Conservative government for as long as possible. That's yeah. why they're... Conservatives, right? Um, that's so, uh, you know, rather than Labour. And so, if, if a party conference can be a, a springboard, then maybe they'll want another one. one. <laughs> a floppy one with pillars. I mean, it was a complicated <laughs> metaphor, but the point is, uh, it, 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 conceptually, right? Yeah, you can you can use a party conference as a pillared based springboard. Maybe they would want. <laughs> Another, do you know there's a pillared room in number 10? And for yeah. years, I thought it was named after like Mr. Pillard. And it was there only later that I realized oh, well, the it's Prime called Minister, the, you, uh, the a pillared room. Prime Minister. They're by the way hollow. Because it's got pillars in it. They're hollow as well. Yeah, but they're pillars. So, pi anyway, never mind. Look, look, you guys, there's only one great precedent for this. And I was talking about it with a uh, Tory strategist, you know, the other month, a couple of months ago. And I t said to him, look, your model is 1986, and then I looked at him carefully, he looked as if he'd been barely born in 1986. <laughs> but that was an incredible Tory party conference. It was when the Tories had started to drift rather badly. Thatcher had gone through a whole series of accidents. 1985-86, Westland, Land Rover, the Tories taking off to bomb Libya and various other things that were happening and things were not going well. But they put together a fantastic party conference in 1986 ahead of the election they knew was going to be the following year and it was called The Next Move Forward and that became the title of the Tory party manifesto, The Next Moves Forward and essentially they just sort of revived themselves. They put in place a whole new set of plans, proposals, yet more privatisation, by the way. I mean, we can come back and discuss this yeah. because well, it was definitely the change strategy writ large. The p pillows were really put in place. I, and my I, God, that was a real springboard so, that Thatcher sprung off into the election year of 87. Can I, can I just question that narrative for a second? I'm not, I'm not disputing it for sure, but I just want to ask you this. Do you, do you think that maybe just afterwards we all sort of could put that narrative on that conference when, in fact, really, the problem was 
the, the Glebe party wasn't going to win from where it was uh, because Neil Kinnock wasn't in a position to govern in the positions that he held um, on, on big political issues. He couldn't win the election from them. The economy was going to go, was going pretty well by that point. We hadn't got to the point where we'd reached the peak of the boom as happened in 1988. So maybe... People just yeah. ascribed to that conference things that had nothing really to do with Danny, it. Danny, I was there. And I had put on a blockbuster Labour Party conference. It's when we unveiled the Red Rose, Labour, putting people first. It was spectacular. And Neil and Glennis were up there on the conference platform throwing red roses into the party faithful. And my God, it, I grabbed somebody's baby from the wings and put the baby <laughs> in Neil's arms. And I mean, it, it couldn't do it. And at the same time, we published a really nice little glitzy brochure with lots of lovely photographs, every page. It was called Investing in People. And I thought, this is takeoff time. I mean, we're turning a corner here. And then the next week, the Tory party conference came and knocked us absolutely sideways. This was a party, a government that we thought would run out of steam, aimlessly drifting all over the place, you know, very difficult to recover. Uh, and yes, of course, the Labour Party was not in an electable state in 86, 87. I accept that. But that party conference and all the new policies that had been put to a sort of inner strategy, you know, group and the highest level of the Tory party, they had put a lot of work into it and it was smashing and it galvanised the party, uh, took the country okay, by so storm and gave Thatcher a lot of confidence. I suppose it's an example of it. Mean, it's, it's a way, you know, people say, well, positions don't win them, governments yeah. lose them, but it's also possible I to, mean, to, compare to change the narrative. Danger, compare yeah. and contrast this yeah. conference okay. and Rishi Sunak. But in now. danger That's of... That's the only point I'm making. Being in it. danger of undermining our point in being here. Um, <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure that being... Stuck up the back! <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> that we, are you sure that being there isn't actually what the problem was? In other words, you were too close to it, right? Okay. And it seemed as though it was yeah. because of the baby and then the Tory, then Ken Baker came out with these policies. It looked like that was the real reason, but actually it was, it was much, much bigger. Actually, Norman Tebbit. But Polly, in your Lib Dem days, uh, in the the bubble of party conferences. You know, I remember Lib Dems always thinking they joined the coalition years. Well, we've had a really good conference, we've announced free school meals and all of that. But actually, nothing. Th those things didn't always really change your fortunes ultimately. I mean, with with the third political party, you know, you just you're crowded out of most of the media, and and I don't mean that in a like complaining about a conspiracy sort of way. It's just it's reality. You're rarely making the news in the way the government or the main opposition are, and so there's this sort of single moment where you actually get some attention and so much time and effort goes into thinking about and then planning for it but but the fundamentals of being the third party cannot be eradicated that in a first past the post system you're just not that important so you'd sort of have this groundswell of excitement and uh and all the applause and you know your leader would whatever it is go and i don't know lick ice cream or hold a baby or play with a dog or something. Um, and in comparison... Or with in the... Ed Davies' case this year, played crazy golf with me. It was, well, a, it was uh, a highlight. Bournemouth does our... have the best crazy golf really of crazy all of the golf. beach resorts yeah. in the United Kingdom. So, yeah. um, But and in comparison with the coverage you're getting the rest of the time, which is basically zero, it feels transcendent. And then along comes the party machine. Sometimes, you know, in the same bloody town and it just descends on the place... And it's so different in scale and scope, yeah. and it, it can just have a different yeah. have a little, impact. Don't you have a little bell? For, for, and for every time we learn something, because we now learn about Bournemouth and the crazy golf, which may be our first yeah. first piece of information. Did you not know that already? I, I, so I thought, always thought it was Brighton that had better crazy no. golf. No, but Bour the, Bournemouth is particularly good. Funny enough, 1986, I was there, but at the SDP conference, I think. I'm right in thinking that was the year that the SDP and the Liberals fell out over defence, over the over the independent nuclear deterrent. And the reason I'm raising that is I'm not sure that really made any difference. So I'm just <laughs> I'm just questioning Peter's narrative. Right? I'm, I, I'm not I'm not saying because we're obviously yeah. got a whole series in order to examine exactly this sort of yeah. thing. Uh, it, it, there are. There are narratives about politics that we're all going to engage in, that we engage in personally, that are all about what we see in front of us, that, that look pretty compelling. So let's take, for example, this year's conference, you said, and I agree that it wasn't a springboard for the Conservatives, and I've been outspoken in arguing that for him to go for a, for Rishi Sunak to go for a time for a change strategy uh, was ridiculous that after that long in office. But whether or not, when we look back on it, 
even from five years, but certainly from 50 years perspective, and you look at what you'll think the reason was they used a failed narrative at their yeah. party conference. I, I don't, I just doubt it. Well, in fact, on the subject of that, Danny, set out your three types of election. Yeah. So really there are, I just think there are three. Time for a change. Uh, it, Britain's on the right track, don't turn back, which interestingly was the 1986-87 Tory slogan. And um, then it's better the devil you know, which won the Tories the election in 1992. Two. And um, you can run time for change in opposition. So what's fascinating about, um, you know, as obviously Tony Blair did in 1997, but, what, but what's fascinating about the last general election, 2019, is Boris Johnson ran time for a change in office. Let's get Brexit done was time for a change from this minute. And what you're going to see in the coming year is Rishi Sunak you know, running through all those gears. He started with a time for a change, but he didn't say what the change was from or to what. Certainly nothing sort of vivid up in lights. We None of us were any the wiser. He'll change gear, in my view, the first sort of green shoot of recovery that sort of dares to poke its head above ground next year. He'll be saying, there you are, I told you so, Britain's on the right track, uh, don't let Labour spoil it. And then it won't be sort of followed by a sort of forest of green shoots <laughs> and everyone will be a bit disappointed and then he'll change gear or two and by but again and by the time we get to the election uh, it will be better the devil you know so uh, it, uh, believe me i predict this yes. that is we are going <laughs> to go through we, all these we, three exactly. all these three we, from all, now until election day we've asked uh, you gov have polled these three the, the danny finkelstein theory of three types of elections so what we thought we'd do uh, is Ask each of you, what proportion of people do you think said it's time for a change? And then we'll see who's closest. A very large proportion. I would say 67%. 67% says Danny. Polly? 52. 52. Peter? 70 plus percent. 70 plus percent. He's just got anything, anything higher than Danny. And the right answer is 55 Yes. 55% well, says I misunderstood the question. <laughs> Did you? I thought you said how many people think it's time for a change. Well, uh, and rather the, than... Think that Polly, Polly heard the same question and got it right. I know. She heard the question properly. She 55% to the said it's time for change. It's the thing you're told in school, is 11% said, better the devil you know. 8% said, Britain is on the right track. Don't turn back. <laughs> so that's going to be a hard sell, that one. 16% uh, said, uh, none of these. And 9% said, don't know. So, uh, so well done, Polly. First, first, first oh. points... It, to Polly in the <laughs> long-running series of polling quizzes that we should be doing. Uh, now, in terms First and possibly last Lib Dem triumph of the year. <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 come on, this is a Let's safe space. Let's not be partisan. A, this is a safe space for that sort of nonsense. So, uh, we've agreed we're a year away from a general election, and we asked you, Gov, actually, to, to ask people how they might feel in a year's time. Do they think they'll be better off or worse off? Because clearly that's the sort of thing that which you soon might be holding out for. 21% of people said that they think things will be better for them personally in a year's time. 30% said they'd be worse off. But for the country as a whole, only 14% of people think things will be better for Britain as a whole this time next year. Half of people think things will be worse. Personal optimism is youngest, uh, highest amongst the young and lowest amongst the old. Or maybe that's just the nature of being young, I suppose. Um, uh, only 20% of 2019 Tory voters think that things will be better for the country this time next year. Uh, rise to only 30% of people who currently say they're going to vote Tory. So quite a hard, quite a hard sell, uh, mm. this, Polly. Can you... What do you do as a political party? Is it possible to shape that optimism? Because at the moment we've got this sort of weird thing that both... The Prime Minister and the Leader of Opposition are you know, going around talking about how sort of terrible everything is. Even the Opposition isn't offering hopey changey. No, and, and in a way you have to sort of stay relatively in step with people. If you, if you are sort of so optimistic uh, when people are not feeling confident that the path towards hope and change is, is very kind of even, then I, I think you sort of alienate people. The first things about this polling is it's really normal to have people be more optimistic about themselves than That's they are about the country. Usually, basically, the more proximate you are... Uh, so most positive about yourself and your family, then your community, then your place, and and then after that, the country. That's just your normal tilt. But this is really, really low. It also, you're right, young people are more likely to be optimistic than older people, and that probably is just a kind of neurobiological thing about how younger brains work. Or maybe it's just reality, because, you know, getting old kind of sucks. Um, but for from a kind of electoral perspective... 
it's tricky because if the Conservatives want to be kind of radical and time for a change and optimistic, the young people aren't interested in them anyway. So that adds an extra kind of piece of conflict between the tone and the emotion that you might want to have it uh, and the voters who you want to appeal to. Do you think that's why I put it? Is it easier for the for the left to be hopey, changey, positive about the future? I think the problem for all the parties at the moment is that people in the country have a huge sense of hopelessness about the future. They do not feel optimistic. They think, I mean, what, 75% think things are going to remain the same or get worse over the next year for themselves personally, for the country, 80%. I, I, you know, going back to your original question about, you know, are you a change person? And I think very many more people than 55% are for change, they want change, uh, they want a better country, better society, better economy, etc., etc. They just don't think it's going to be possible to achieve it. I think Pete, one of the problems we have, and it's a big challenge for the Labour Party, is to show how they can overcome their pessimism, how the Labour Party can offer uh, hope, how the Labour Party can, can persuade people that things really can get better. There's so much cynicism. People are so down in the mouth. The country's depressed. You know, they, I think they're desperate to turn the page. They want to start a new chapter in our national story, but they're not at all sure how or whether it would be possible to do it. Is some of it about the personality of Keir Starmer, that he's not a very hopey, changey, smiling, happy, think, clappy person? So I think it's the economic situation. So I think these these numbers are very important because they're really the driver. The, the, how people feel and how people feel it's going, particularly when, when you get to within about six months of a general election, there's really, a, I mean, most of the political science shows a really strong relationship between this sort of number... And the, and, the, and the outcome. And obviously Rishi Sunak knows about this, is the reason why he's gone for this, it's time uh, for a change himself, because he realises you can't run a Britain's on the right track if people aren't optimistic. Not And, and Polly's right, these numbers are really low, um, you know, historically, and, you know, just in absolute terms, if you think about even the proportions saying they're going to vote Conservative, I and mean, the number who are optimistic is below that. That's really um, serious. You, you probably could, and Peter prefigured this when he said he thought that was where the Tories would end up. You you probably could run a better the devil you know on the basis that people are pessimistic, not just about the government, but about everybody. And you could persuade them, yes, it's really bad. And I agree it's not getting better. But these people would be even worse. Yeah, the problem, so the, the, if, problem if the Tories have got with that strategy... Better, then they might fear the problem, it could get worse. Yeah. The problem There's the Tories have got yeah. with that strategy, you, know, you can see an example of it on the news over the last few days. While everything's been going on in Gaza, domestically, we've seen all these WhatsApp messages in the COVID inquiry. The Conservative Party ran the government during Boris Johnson's period on this very serious matter, like a circus. And so people, how are you going to persuade people where it would be even worse, uh, you know, if Keir Starmer got in? That is going to be the difficulty. So they, I think these numbers do force them into this pessimistic, more pessimistic strategy, mm. uh, which is, you know, yes, it's bad. Uh, yes, you don't think things are getting better, but these people would be even worse, as Peter said, um, you'd end up with that strategy, but you'll have difficulty making it fly just because Rishi Sunak hasn't yet, which he could, draw a clear line between himself and his two immediate predecessors. And people there say, therefore say, well, you know, you didn't do very well yourselves. Why would I think someone well, else that, would well, do that, worse? That, that's the problem for Rishi Sunak, is that he doesn't dare or can't summon the confidence or nerve to basically denounce his two predecessors. If he wants to be the change candidate and the change prime minister, he has to set out in pretty vivid terms what went wrong with Johnson and what was wrong with Truss as well. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't really have the authority in his party to pull well, the that one off. Time, the one time he's pulled it off, he did this... There was a... Uh, the most inside baseball thing, the Westminster Correspondents Dinner, the sort of lobby dinner, based on the White House one, a few weeks ago, where mm. Rishi Sunak gave Safe a speech. Space. Safe space. He gave a speech, it. but <laughs> he was very funny and cutting about Boris yeah. Johnson, and it was the most convincing yeah. Yeah. change candidate approach. And actually, if he'd done more yeah. of that... He needed to get up at his party conference. Exactly, party conference to do it. Do it at PMQs. Make a joke of the fact that he's yeah. not Liz Truss, instead of sort of trying to reinvent But the, the funny thing is, one of his big attacks on Keir Starmer is Keir Starmer served under Jeremy Corbyn, and if you're going to slag off Boris Johnson, then people might reasonably ask, why did you, yeah. you know, serve as his chancellor for all of that time? Why didn't you step away from that government slightly earlier than at the very last 
minute. I also think there's there's a risk with the pessimistic campaign that Danny's talking about, which uh, if you remember the, the the Brexit referendum, that was kind of uh, run by the Remain campaign as I know everything's really terrible right now, but it could be a lot worse. Yeah. Liberate, and, but no, they said it would be Liberation Day if you vote for Brexit. The, I mean, yeah, but that's what the Brexit campaign, yeah. the Remain campaign, the Remain campaign tried to tried to scare people. Say uh, I know it, like yeah. life's quite tough, but it, it yeah. will only get worse. I mean, it turns out they were right, but but. <laughs> Actually, scaring yeah. people like that, scaring people who are depressed, I think generally leads to a, a sort of sense of yeah. recklessness. Well, you know, let's just chuck it all up into the air and who cares? Like, if, if, if there's nothing to lose, ugh, yeah. who cares? The, the, and so the, the, I, I the, just think it's The only way that Labour is going to succeed in overcoming this sort of pessimism that uh, is, uh, exists across the country is by offering hope to people. I mean, hope yeah. conquers pessimism. And in that sense, Keir Starmer's got to become the man with the plan. I mean, how are we going to turn things around in the long term? But there's been a very interesting debate going on in the Labour Party you know, during this year where people, some people have said, no, we've got to prioritise reassurance. Given where we've come from, given that we're in recovery mode from Jeremy Corbyn, uh, we've got to <coughs> reassure, reassure, reassure. Well, don't jettison reassurance. It's yeah, the yeah. absolutely right. sort of basic qualification. But now you've got to offer hope as long as it is not false optimism and ridiculous hope. You've got to, it's got to be mixed with realism. So there are three sides to this triangle, hope, realism and reassurance, and Labour's got to but operate if, on all sorry, three. Yeah. But if people are pessimistic, I think pessimism can work. Is it interesting on, you mentioned the Remain campaign, because the assumption is because Remain lost, it was a terrible campaign. I actually think getting 48% proposing that we should have a single immigration policy with Latvia wasn't a bad result. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, and, you know, considering all the things that you have on the table and you know what people think it was actually quite good that Remain came second um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, so um, uh, so I think we could uh, you know I think that's it why it's such a stupid idea to call the referendum in the uh, first place can. well uh, that Danny. is outside that is that is <laughs> that not is on beyond the that it's not called how to uh, win a referendum but the I do and I, I think so I think I think if you were able to land um the idea that you could be, you know, worried about Labour, uh, then you can make that pessimistic campaign work in pessimistic circumstances. But it does require, and, I, you know, I share your view, Peter, and Polly, I, I, I cannot understand why Rishi Sunak has not said what he definitely thinks, which is, you know, I picked up after two immediate disasters which had gone off the rails, mm. both ec ethically and economically. And he, considering he thinks those things and they would be authentic, they really unlock a lot of... I think what we're, what we're yeah. discovering in this discussion is they really unlock a lot of arguments. Yeah. And yeah. instead he's but completely he bottled it. up. Yeah. yeah. So when you talk about needing a plan, you know, and your triangles and your planks and your plinths... Um, Given the, Spring if we, board, springboards, 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 and the pillars, and the pillars. <laughs> um, if you are looking ahead to an election, when you've been in these positions, would you expect both sides, one side, to have landed on its plan a year out from a general election? How, you, know, it, when, when would you know whether it's I don't know whether it's in ninety six or or uh, twenty ten? When do you know your the the outline of what you're going to do? When do you start having the you know the team and the policies and and all of that? Is a year? I mean, it, it feels like if you if you don't have a year, what's the right sort of what is the right sort of time scale? A year ahead, you have the basic outlook, you the right tone, the direction of travel. I mean, that, and that is what I saw coming from Starmer at the Labour Party conference. I thought, you know, get Britain's future back was basically right with future in block caps and, you know, going off on and off like a neon yeah. sign. Future, future, future. That was just about right. But look, let's be very clear about this. And this is why this podcast is going to go, have to go on for a very long week in, week out for a year. You know, the, the people's <laughs> voting... Bit, bit, bit people's people's <laughs> final <laughs> voting decision <laughs> will not crystallise yeah. until much nearer the election. I mean, yes, it is fashionable to say, and I, to a great extent, uh, agree that people have written off the Tories, but they've not yet run into the arms of the Labour Party and they don't know, you know what sort of alternative the Lib Dems represent. That will crystallise for most voters, you know, not next week or the week after. It'll be much nearer the election. What you want to do at this stage uh, is start drawing people to, towards you, defining yourself, putting the outline in place and, and also creating some of the dividing lines on which you're going to fight the election against the Conservatives yeah. in a year's time. 
Well, we'll see. Uh, if the t- it doesn't seem, feel like maybe maybe they've been holding out for this podcast and they'll be listening and taking notes and then, and then everyone will up their game massively. Uh, right up next, uh, we're going to do some of your questions. If you want to send in a question to Danny, Polly, Peter, and me, you can email how to win at times radio. How to win at times radio. Uh, Phil's in Blackpool's already been in touch saying with the mariachi feel to the theme music, should the gang be called the Three Amigos? But well, this is a very topical question that Tony sent in. Thinking back to Macmillan's famous quote, "Events, dear boy, events." I mean, that is a cliche that we'd normally try to avoid, but that's fine. Uh, when asked about the greatest challenges for statesmen, to what extent does the panel think that the current conflagra- conflagration conflagration in the Middle East has the potential to derail Keir Starmer? We've already seen a bit of derailing in the past couple of weeks since the Labour Party conference. He is making a speech after we've spoken, so we don't know what he's going to say. We assume he's going to recommit to his position. <coughs> How big is the risk of the derailing Keir Starmer, Peter? A uh, very low risk of derailing him. Uh, big challenge, though, to get it right, because what's important for Keir Starmer as the leader of the opposition uh, is that he, he's he got to, as it were, say now what he would do in government. He's got to, in a sense, pretend he's in government. People have got to think of him as being prime minister and what he would do in a crisis like this. So, you know, you don't sort of say one thing in opposition and do it differently in government. It's got to be the same, and I think that that is what has guided him in his approach now. I mean, he's uh, uh, offered a very sort of clear analysis. You know, he's been very calm, clear analysis, but he's also been very clear, a lot of clarity about what's right and wrong in this situation. And yes, it's caused a, a bit of a you know backlash from a minority in the party, a number of momentum uh, campaign uh, organisation councillors have resigned. Other people just feel sort of horrified and passionate, obviously, about the pictures they're seeing on the television. Who wouldn't be? I mean, the Labour Party is a very humanitarian party. Uh, we tend to wear our, you know, our hearts on our sleeves, but at the same time, we have to keep a cool head. And the cool head to us says, and it says to Keir Starmer, this is cold blooded murder that has been visited on the Israeli people and for them just to sort of do nothing and not to take the fight to Hamas to stop them doing this again to defend their country and their people would be ridiculous can you imagine Britain doing that in similar circumstances of course we wouldn't we would be there that's what we had to do in Northern Ireland during the 70s and and the 80s and yes you know, we did disable the provisional IRA. We did defeat them militarily. And then we drove them to a position where they had no alternative but to turn to politics and to negotiate a peace agreement. And that's what we were also ready to do. Now, that's that's not the so precise, long way down the road, not the precise yeah. uh, circumstances that we're facing in Israel uh, or Gaza. Obviously not. But this is a process, a journey on which we're on, in my view, And in due course, we will turn to politics, we will turn to negotiation, but that time is a long way off. And in the meantime, we have to defeat cold-blooded murderers. Danny, in part, this question is paying Keir Starmer a compliment, which isn't visited on all leaders of the opposition, a sense that he is on course to become Prime Minister. So therefore, what he says about something that's happening quite a long way away matters in the real world rather than a sort of issuing of press release world. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> Look, let me take out to one side. You know, I agree very strongly with what Peter said, as you might expect I do. Let's just look at it in a cold political way. When you when you take a position on an issue like this, the most important thing for him is that he takes an issue, takes a position that he agrees with, that he can stick with and won't be pushed off by the rest of the party. So it's important that, for example, you have your clause for battles, but you mustn't lose them. Uh, you know, William Hague, once we had a battle on the question of grammar schools in the... Sorry, David Cameron had a battle on the question of grammar schools and then effectively was seen to be to move from that position. It was very damaging uh, to him. Uh, whether or not he did or didn't wasn't really the issue. He looked like he had. And so it's important for Keir Starmer that he looks like he's taken a position and then can sustain it with his party. So the trick with this speech is... To stick with where to stick with his the stand stance that he's got to adjust it just enough to accommodate enough people in his party that he's not going to be pushed off enough the stand. reasonable and people in his party, Danny. Yes, reasonable people, absolutely. And then and then there's another question which I'd just be interested in what Polly thinks about it. Does this issue create a space for the Liberal Democrats, uh, who've anyway always been? Um, 
to the left of Labour, really, on the Palestinian question, uh, and uh, also did, you know, <coughs> have very successful period politically during the Iraq war. Does it create a place for a Davy to call for a ceasefire, thus creating a distinctive Liberal Democrat position? Again, I'm not here talking about my own, what I wanted question. to do. I'm just wondering whether that isn't what he might think is the right thing to do. I mean, it, it automatically feels like the wrong set of questions to be asking, doesn't it, when there are uh, babies dying mm. across the Middle East. Um, but you know, given the context of the discussion, uh, it, it is the way in which politicians, I think, in the end, have to, uh, in part, consider uh, because party management is a sort of fundamental success factor for any uh, any political leader, and and it's that can can you take your party with you? Can you hold a line? Because if you can't, you're actually not fit to be the prime minister, um, and in. I, th I think this is incredibly difficult in every party. Actually, every party has uh, 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 movements for whom uh, the protection uh, and the defence of Israel are the most important and, and movements in which it is the Palestinian cause that, that takes precedence. And because, rightly, it is so emotional and so uh, salient for people, I think most most political leaders have to find a kind of... an. Uh, an empathy and ability to connect with those very, very strong feelings, but also try and kind of create boundaries. I, I can absolutely see the allure kind of from a tactical position for Liberal Democrats to get sort of sucked into taking one side. Um, but of course, that would have consequences uh, for some groups within their own party, but also for the way uh, the nation tries to hold together in 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 the context of this, where there are people on the streets um, taking, you know, incredibly horrible positions against against each other. We're seeing, you know, the rise in anti-Semitism, the rise in Islamophobia, and, and a feeling that any political party should get sucked into kind of short-term politics around that feels, I think, pretty abhorrent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, um, I think we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Well, it was a good. I think we've done all right for the first time. It's not a bad rehearsal. It'd be great when we do it properly. Well, uh, this isn't live. No, is it, it is. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it was a. It was a you mean we've been out on air? Yes, I know. It's extraordinary. You didn't swear once, Peter. This is going into a podcast. It's, it's going to be a late. podcast as well. Uh, if you want to send in questions, you can email us uh, how to win at times radio or at times at the times .co.uk. They do both work, don't we? How to win at times radio, and uh, Danny, Polly, and Peter will answer your questions uh, next week. Uh, that's a bit it from us this week. Uh, don't forget you can listen live on Times Radio Tuesdays from ten, or listen whenever you like wherever you get your podcasts. Just remember to follow us so you never miss a future episode of How to Win an Election.